We have been dealing for several weeks with Jesus saying that he is the resurrection. He actually said, I am the resurrection and the life. And we have looked at him as the resurrection and how that applies to his body, which is the church. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. We also looked at, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And we studied the way and the truth. Well, we're beginning the study of the life. He declared of himself that he is the life. Glory to God. So now we'll center our attention around this statement, I am the life. I want us to hear that, I am the life. I am the life. Glory to God. In Christianity, much of our hope is based on having eternal life. None of us want to die or physically end the life that we're having here and there. None of us, I, there are very few people want their physical life to end. Very few people I know or have known have been in a position where they want their physical life to end. However, many of us view eternal life simply as us living forever without any sickness or pain, having bodies that do not get sick, having eternal relationships with families and friends, or not having sin in our lives. That's, that's what we picture in our heart, that Jesus came and said that he was giving us eternal life. He did say that. He said, he that believeth on me shall never die, believest thou this. So he did say that. He did declare that we would have eternal life. But I'm not certain that we really many times hear what he said. I am the life. And to begin to really define it and understand it, I want us to start in the book of John chapter 12. And I want us to ask ourselves, what did Jesus mean about him being life? And, and how's that different than just you and I living forever and not having sin or committing sins? How's this different? Or is it different? I want us to ask that question to the Lord. Well, in John 12, verse 20, the Bible says, And there were certain Greeks among them that came up to worship at the feast. The same came therefore to Philip, which was, the, was of Bethsaida of Galilee, and desired him, saying, Sir, we would see Jesus. Philip cometh and telleth Andrew, and again, Andrew and Philip tell Jesus. And Jesus answered them, saying, The hours come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bring forth much fruit. He that loveth his life shall lose it. And he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. Now, if I take this at surface, at the surface, it appears that I would keep my life, if I hate it, to life eternal. If I take this on the surface, okay. But let's dig a little bit deeper. In this scripture, there are two different Greek words used for life. One of them is the word suke. Suke, 5590 in your Bible, Bible, excuse me, which means the vital breath, breath of life, the human soul. 
the soul as the seat of affections and will, the self, a human person and individual. That's how it's defined in Strong's and other Bible helps. So the first two instances of life here is dealing with soul life. And the last, it shall keep it unto life eternal, is dealing with a different kind or quality of life. This is Zoe life. This is eternal life. And it's a different word. It's not soul life. And so Jesus said that he that loveth his soul life or soul self shall lose it. And he that hateth, hateth his self life, soul life, in this world shall keep it unto eternal life. Now, remember what Jesus declared of himself. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the life. So we would keep our life unto eternal life. We would keep our soul unto eternal life. <laughs> So in this picture is, I believe, the simplicity of the gospel. When Jesus declares this, unless a corn of wheat falls into the ground and die, it abides alone. But if it die, it brings forth much fruit. So he is speaking, of course, of himself. He's the corn of wheat. He falls into the ground made of a woman, made under the law, to die the death of the cross, to bring forth an increase of himself. Now we, as mankind, must come to him. That's the start. And when we come to him, what miraculously happens is we receive him through the Spirit. If you have ever received the Lord, you know what I'm talking about. It's miraculous. Christ indwells you. That's eternal life. Christ in you. Glory to God. If we could see that and get a hold of that, that eternal life isn't just me and you living forever without sin, without sickness, without disease. That's, that's not big enough. That's not big enough. That's not great enough for what eternal life is. It is Christ living in you. And you growing up, you and I, me, growing up in him. And eternal life begins not after our physical bodies die, not after we get to heaven, not someday over there or in the sweet by and by. Eternal life begins when Christ, who is our life, comes into us. That's when eternal life begins. And we have at that time eternal life because eternal life is him. To live, Paul says in one place, is Christ. For me to live is Christ. So to live is what he is. I love that. I probably read it many, many times. In fact, I know I did before I ever heard it and saw it by the Spirit of God. To live is Christ. So any measure of living 
is a measurement of Christ that dwells in me. Hallelujah to the Lamb of the living God. In John 17, in John 17, Jesus says, this, what does he say? This is life eternal. I'm going to turn there and read it. But that life eternal, he declares, is knowing the only true God. He says, and this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. So life eternal or eternal life is knowing the only true God. All right. So that's, that's saying a lot, folks. Knowing the only true God. That doesn't mean we come up and shake God's hand and we know him. That's the same thing I quoted to you a while ago for me to live is Christ. It's the knowing of Christ in you that is life. And that's what this is dealing with, to know, to know intimately, to know inwardly, to know in your being. That's eternal life. To know the eternal God in your being. And we know the eternal God in our being by Christ living in us. Glory to God. And by him being revealed by his spirit. That's how we know eternal life. See, that's what we live in once we receive him. When we are born from above, born of God, we are born of God to know God. We were born in Adam and we knew man. That's simple. We knew what was in man. Sometimes, as far as natural men go, they think they're one thinks they're way greater than another. And, and the truth is, like the old saying, we all put our pants on the same way. We all know the things of man, according to the natural man. But to know the things of God, I must be born from above. There must be a spiritual birth that takes place in my heart to know the things of God. And that's the beginning. That's the beginning for you and I. It's not the beginning for him because he always is, <laughs> always was, always will be. But for you and I, that's the beginning, that he is birthed in you and we are birthed in him, that Christ comes into our heart and we are born again. We're not born again of corruptible seed, the apostle Peter writes. We're not born again of flesh, not of the will of man, John writes. In the book of the John, in John 1, not of the will of man, but we're born again by the Spirit of God. By the word of God, Peter says in First Peter, in First Peter 1, the Bible says in blessed be the God and Father, this is verse 3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again begotten of God, to beget, to, were born begotten of God. And, and this next part of this verse of scripture is so powerful. We 
have probably read over it, maybe like me, not really comprehended it, but it says, begotten again unto a lively hope. The word lively in the King James means to live. To live. And the word hope means to anticipate, usually with pleasure, expectation. So it could have read, we've been but begotten again unto a living expectation. Now in Adam all die, Paul says. In Christ all are made alive. And, and the living that's in Christ is that of Christ himself. That's what the living is. As we come into the life, we're in the life of another. Hallelujah to the Lamb of the living God. And this life is so great as we begin to experience it in our soul. We begin to see it's bigger. We begin to understand why Paul wrote, quoted out of the old covenant, I haven't seen, ear, haven't heard, never entered into the heart of man the things that God hath prepared for him. And many people make that so small. Well, that's mansions in the sky. That's streets paved with gold. Honey, even if you have mansions in the sky and streets paved with gold, it would not compare to the life of the living Christ. What I hadn't seen and ear hadn't heard was our being, our soul, would find its life in Christ. Glory to the Lamb of the living God. Now when you read this in Peter, that we have been begotten again unto a living hope, and this living hope is the life of Christ in you, by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, from the dead. And we've dealt with that for weeks, how he came out from the dead, out from among the dead, out from the old man. Now we have come out from the old man to this living expectation that Christ is our life. to an inheritance incorruptible. Now, again, this inheritance incorruptible, we, we've compared this most of our days, many Christians, to natural things. It's not like the earth, that, that our home and earth would perish. No, it's not. Because the incorruptible inheritance is the incorruptible seed of God that Peter says we are born of, that we have been begotten again and our inheritance is in the one we are begotten in, who is Christ. That's our inheritance. That's our life, to grow up in him. Glory to the Lamb of the living God. Let us get a hold of this. Let us set our expectation on knowing him. That we would live in him. Being made, as Paul says, conformable to his death. Letting the spirit of God work freely in us to bring us into union with his death, if by any means we might attain unto the resurrection from the dead, which would be his life. Huh. Hallelujah to the Lamb of the living God. What a place. What a place God 
has prepared for me and you. Jesus saying, I go to prepare a place for you that I haven't seen, that ear haven't heard, that never entered into the heart of man, that the living Christ would dwell in us. Now, honey, that's the place. That's what he prepared at the cross. Oh, you read all of John 14 and and just allow the Spirit of God to show it to you. It's right there in John 14. Jesus declaring that where I am, there you may be also. And then he declares, I'm in the Father, and the Father's in me. And he's going away. He's going to the cross to prepare a place for you and I. And he says, when the spirit shall come, and that was after his death, burial, and resurrection that the spirit came. And he says that when the spirit comes, we would know. We would know. We would know. Life eternal. We would know. I am in my father. You are in me. And I am in you. We would know the place that I hadn't seen, ear hadn't heard, what had not entered into the heart of man. We would know by the Spirit of God. We would know the living Christ. That's what we know. That's that's what our salvation is. That's what we come together to gather for is the knowing of him my lord christians all over the earth are many many of them in turmoil because they don't know their life some of them make statements like i don't know my purpose Christ living in you, you living in Christ. There's no higher purpose. Now, God may set you in the body as a apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, or teacher. He may set you in there and work in you helps. But honey, the evangelist or pastor or teacher is not greater than you. The greatness of the body is the Lord himself. Honey, it's time that people understand that, that the body of Christ, yes, it's made up of many members, but what's filling each member and joining them together to function in the earth is the Lord Jesus himself. That's the mystery that was hid from ages and from generations that's being declared, that's been declared since the days of the Apostle Paul, Christ in you, the hope of glory. It's been declared and being declared all over the earth. And that's what unifies us. Doctrines will never do it. Agreeing on doctrines will never unify us. It's this eternal life that you and I have. Knowing the things of God. Knowing that of Christ. It goes on in 1 Corinthians 2, and I've quoted part of it. As is written, I haven't seen, ear, haven't heard, neither hath entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. See, see, Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. Now, here it is. Here it is. Verse number 10 of 1 Corinthians 2. But God hath revealed what's prepared. 
hear that, folks. But God hath revealed the things which he prepared. That's what it says up above. The things which God hath prepared for them that love him. God hath revealed them to us. What is the them? It's Christ. God reveals in us his son. It's the measurements of him that's revealed in us. And that's the place he prepared. He prepared it in death, burial, and resurrection that you and I would live in this glorious life. And then, then it goes on here and it says, For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. All the deep things of God are measured out again in the person. Paul speaks of the length, the depth, the breadth, and the height of Jesus Christ. I believe it's in the book of Ezekiel and the book of Revelation. I believe maybe in both of them. You have a man with a line in his hand, and a man with, with measurement. And see, the whole city is measured. The temple is measured. And who's measuring it is the man, is Christ Jesus, the Lord. It's the measurement of him. The abundance of the city is him. It's a people who are filled with him. That's the city of God. It's not a place in the Middle East. It's a people who are filled with him. That's the temple. You know, think of this. The temple in the old covenant was a place in the Middle East, in, in Israel, in Jerusalem. But you've not come to Mount Sinai. You've not come to the old covenant. You haven't come to the natural Israel. But Paul says you've come to the heavenly Jerusalem. Honey, that you would be built upon the foundation of Jesus Christ and be filled with this glorious life. Hallelujah. To be his expression in the earth. A city set on a hill whose light cannot be hid. His expression. His expression. That's what this city expresses. You must lose your lives, just like we started in John 12. And that's what Paul's writing in these epistles that I haven't seen. I, I've, I've seen the natural life, the eye of the natural eye, saw the natural life and the eye of the soul, the heart, saw the natural life. He, he goes on down here in in 1 Corinthians 2, but God hath revealed them. We read that for what man, verse 11, knows the things of man, save the spirit of man which is in him. So the eye knows the things of man. Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. So, so if you get into the eyes of your understanding, the eyes of your heart, from a natural perspective, you know what's in man. But Naturally, till you're born again and filled with Christ, with his spirit, you do not know the things of God. They are spiritually known, spiritually discerned, and they are known in the revealing of Jesus Christ in you. And he says, now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know, know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things 
was spiritual. So we're speaking the mysteries of Christ, taught by the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah to the Lamb of the living God. Because that's what he prepared for us, to be one with him. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, we shall appear with him in glory. His glory. His glory. I believe it deals with his divine nature. I really do. Having his divine nature in us. Yes. To be his expression. If he's in you, wouldn't it make sense that his divine nature would be formed in us? If he's in us? Sure it would. Sure it would. Christ being formed in you, Christ living in you. See, to me, this is life eternal. This is what we're born again for, is to grow up in him that we're born of. We did that in the natural. See, naturally, we grew up from our mother and father. Sure, we did. But we're born again in this new birth, outside of us being here. And Christ filling our heart, our mother and father has nothing to do with it at all. Not of the will of men, but of God. And that had, and even us being here naturally had to do with God. So this new birth doesn't have to do with mom and dad. It has to do with God. And now that we're born again, he has separated us from the earth that we can see the things of the heavens. And when I say that, I'm talking about the things of the Spirit. In, in John 3, to me, that's plain. That spiritual and heavenly, I believe, could be interchanged. Read John chapter 3 real close. In fact, I'll read that here as we come to a close in this lesson. John 3. A man came to Jesus by night, which we've read the last few weeks, or within the last few weeks, named Nicodemus. He was a rabbi, a teacher of the Jews, or he was a, excuse me, a Pharisee, a teacher, a ruler of the Jews. And the same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. So so Nicodemus is a Pharisee, and he comes to Jesus and he calls him rabbi, teacher. And Jesus answered him, verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So here, sight of God's kingdom comes through new birth, not through these eyes but through spiritual birth. Nicodemus saith unto him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of, this, of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So, just like these eyes can't see it, neither can these feet take you there <laughs> to the kingdom of God. You must be born of spirit. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. 
Marvel not that I said unto thee, you must be born again or born from above, according to the translation. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell when, where, whence it cometh, and whether it goeth, so is everyone born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou a master of Israel, and knowest not these things? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, We speak that we do know, and, do, and testify that we have seen, and you receive not our witness, if I have told you earthly things and you believe not. How shall you believe if I tell you heavenly things? Well, Jesus told them earthly things. If you go read the Gospels, he spoke to them of things pertaining to the fulfillment of the prophecies concerning the nation of Israel. This generation shall not pass away. It didn't pass. It didn't pass away till all things were fulfilled. And, the, and it was right up on that people Jesus was speaking of. But honey, listen, here he's speaking to Nicodemus of someone being birthed of spirit. That is heavenly. That's not earthly. That's not earthly. And see, our encounter with God is a heavenly, spiritual encounter. It's not like the old covenant Jews. Now that was, if you study that out, that's miraculous. God took that nation out of a man and woman. <laughs> a man too old, I for children and a woman who's was past age as well and had never had a child. He brought forth Isaac and a nation came forth. And that nation is the testimony of Jesus Christ. But when Jesus came, it was fulfilled. He was the Savior of the world. He was the Redeemer of Israel. Still is. But the Jews would not come to him, or many of the Jews. Now Paul, Peter, John, the apostles, they were Jews. Many or all of the early believers, I believe, were Jews. They came to Jesus. But Israel as a nation rejected him. See, there came out of Christ a new man, born of spirit. That's what, that's what that birth of Isaac represented, of him coming forth of a woman and man past her age with, without the ability to have children, a woman with no ability to have children. It was speaking of the work that God was going to do in Christ, that this was not going to be a man, but it was going to be of God. It was going to be of spirit. And you and I, honey, when we receive Christ, we are born of spirit. Into his life to be filled up with him to grow up in him, to be a new creation man. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. And this man's full of life. This man's full of life. And the life that he's full of is Christ. That's what you and I are filled with. But, honey, we have eternal life if we have Christ. I have come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. And that abundant life is him living in you. And the abundance of him, the fullness of him, being revealed in our hearts. Well, 
May the Lord really touch our minds and hearts concerning life. And we'll be looking at this life in the coming weeks, this life of Christ that we have, we that are his. Will God richly bless you? In Jesus' glorious name, amen.